Welcome to the Deep Dive. Today, we're going deep into the mind of Francis Schaeffer, that Christian philosopher. You know. Yes, Schaeffer. We got a listener question, wanted us to really dig into his views on modern theology. Okay, sure. Specifically from his book, The Complete Works of Francis A. Schaeffer, A Christian Worldview. It's a big one. Yeah, Schaeffer's a fascinating figure, especially like if you really want to understand what was going on in the 20th century, like in intellectually and spiritually, mm-hmm. he's your guy. He was really in the thick of it. Yeah, and he wasn't just a critic, you know? Mm-hmm. He was really trying to connect the dots between philosophy, art, music, even literature. To understand how these things all fit together. Exactly. To understand what he called the levels of despair in modern thought. Okay, levels of despair, that's pretty intense. It is. But before we get into those levels, you mentioned Schaefer tackled how modern theology had kind of strayed from its roots, right? Mm -hmm. Where did he see the biggest issues? Like, what was he pushing back against? Schaefer argued that modern theology, even though it came in all these different flavors and forms, it had this, like, fundamental methodology problem. A methodology problem, okay. Yeah, it was built on shaky ground. Mm. He believed it had moved away from a unified concept of truth, the kind he saw in traditional biblical Christianity. So it's almost like we're working from different dictionaries when we even say the word truth. Exactly. And there's this term he uses, lower story. I feel like that's a big part of his argument. Yes, the lower story. It's a key concept for Schaefer. He uses this analogy to explain how modern thought kind of splits truth into these two separate realms. Okay, two different stories. Yeah. So down in the lower story, that's the world of reason and science and logic, what we can observe and measure. Our concrete stuff. Exactly. But then up in the upper story, that's where faith lives. That's meaning, purpose, those big existential questions. The stuff that's harder to pin down. Exactly. Mm. And Schaefer's point is, you can't just have an upper story without a solid lower story to support it. It's like building a house on sand. Yeah. Exactly. It's going to collapse. Yeah. And he felt like that's what these modern theologians were doing, trying to find ultimate meaning in that lower story where it just doesn't exist. And that led to those levels of despair we were talking about. You got it. Imagine a building with a shaky foundation. That's what he saw happening to faith. And he even makes this comparison to the Protestant Reformation back in the day. Okay, back to Martin Luther and all that. Exactly. Yeah. He said that those reformers weren't just nitpicking individual doctrines. They were challenging the whole system. Like a system error. Exactly. And Schaefer felt like we needed that same system-level critique of modern theology. Not just disagreeing on interpretations, but really questioning the whole foundation. You got it. It's about how we understand the very nature of truth itself. Okay, so let's get into those levels of despair. What are they and what makes them so, well, despairing? All right, so Schaefer identifies three. The first one is nihilism. Nihilism, that's a heavy one. It is. It's the belief that nothing really matters, that everything's meaningless, chaotic, purposeless. Like, why even bother getting out of bed in the morning? Right. You see this reflected in art forms like daddyism, where it's all about randomness and absurdity. So it's a complete surrender to meaninglessness. Exactly. Yeah. But here's the thing. Most people aren't like card-carrying nihilists, you know? Right. It's a pretty bleak way to live. So the second level of despair is a little more subtle. Schaefer calls it the acceptance of a dichotomy. Dichotomy meaning? A division. Like trying to live in both stories at once. We accept the rational world of science but then try to keep faith and meaning tucked away in that separate upper story, never letting them really connect. So we're left with this kind of internal tug of war. Exactly. Logic and reason on one side, but no real sense of purpose there. And then on the other side, this leap of faith into something that feels good, but doesn't quite mesh with our understanding of the world. And that struggle, that tension, Schaefer argues, leads to the third level of despair. Semantic mysticism. Okay, now you're just using big words to sound smart. Maybe a little, but it's really not that complicated. All right, break it down for me. Semantic mysticism. What does that even mean? Basically, it's using religious words and symbols, you know, w- words like God, grace, spirituality, but... But without really believing in them. Not just that. They still carry a hint of their old meaning, but they've been stripped of their weight, their original definitions. So it's like people are clinging to these big, important sounding words, but they're not really connecting them to anything concrete. It's more about the feeling than the actual belief. Like a hollowed out shell, all form, no substance. Exactly. 
Mm. And Schaefer argued that this wasn't true faith. It was more like a, a faith in faith itself. Faith in the feeling. Exactly. Yeah. And get this. He didn't just call out theologians on this. Oh, no. He saw this semantic mysticism everywhere in art, music, literature, you name it. Okay, now you've got my attention. He saw this in art. Oh, yeah. Big time. He starts with Leonardo da Vinci. Da Vinci. The Mona uh, Lisa guy. The one and only. Now, we think of da Vinci as this genius, this renaissance man. But Schaefer points out that da Vinci really struggled to find a way to connect, to unify the universal and the particular. What does that even mean? He wanted to capture the essence of humanity, that universal soul, through his art. You know, Very ambitious. Right. But Schaefer says, ultimately, da Vinci never quite bridged that gap, the gap between the finite and the infinite, the material and the spiritual. So he's stuck with this longing for unity he can't quite grasp. Exactly. And this tension, Schaefer argues, is a reflection of a bigger struggle going on within modern man. So da Vinci becomes almost a tragic figure in this sense. In a way, yes. And Schaefer sees this same struggle reflected in the works of other artists, too, like Paul Klee. Hold on. Paul Klee, the abstract... Creator one and only. What does he have to do with any of this? Schaefer was all about making these unexpected connections. He calls Klee's art a kind of visual Ouija board. Wait, a Ouija board like trying to contact spirits? Well, not literally. But he's saying that Klee and other modern artists, they were hoping to tap into some kind of universal force to let the universe speak through their art. Even if they didn't believe in a personal God or anything. Exactly. It's about looking for meaning in the absence of a defined source. You know, trying to find something up there in that upper story even without a solid foundation beneath it. So it's less about expressing a specific message and more about hoping that something, anything, will break through from the other side. That's a really interesting way to look at it. It is, and it's not just visual art either. Schaefer finds this same trend in 20th century music too. Okay, now this, I gotta hear. What kind of music are we talking about here? Well, he talks about composers like uh, Leonard Bernstein, for example. Wait, Leonard Bernstein, Mr. West Side Story. The one and only. What does he have to do with semantic mysticism? So, Schaefer points to Bernstein's Kaddish Symphony as a prime example of this. The Kaddish? That the is. Jewish prayer. Right, right. A prayer that praises God. Exactly. But Bernstein takes this deeply religious text and sets it within a framework of modern unbelief. So, another example of taking something with profound religious meaning and reinterpreting it through a more secular lens. Exactly. But what about the music itself? How does that reflect this shift, this semantic mysticism? Well, that's the key, right? The music itself, even though it's powerful and moving, it doesn't actually point to a defined deity. It's more about the experience, the feeling, with Bernstein acting as a kind of intermediary between the audience and the unknown. It's like saying, look, we might not know if God exists, but we can still have this powerful, emotional, aesthetic experience through music. It's the feeling that matters. Exactly. And then you have someone like John Cage. Oh boy, John Cage. Now there's a name. You're familiar with his work. Let's just say 4 foot 33 is a very memorable experience. That's one way to put it. Four minutes and 33 seconds of silence. It definitely makes you think. That was Cage's whole thing, right? He wanted to challenge our very definition of music. And Schaefer argues that in trying to eliminate personal expression from his music, Cage was really trying to create a space where the universe itself could speak. So it's like he was constructing this sonic void and hoping that something bigger would rush in to fill it. And what's fascinating is that Cage, for all his talk about the absurdity of life, he couldn't actually live by his own philosophy. Oh, how so? So Schaefer tells this great story about Cage's love of mycology. The study of mushrooms. Okay. Didn't see that coming. Right. Apparently, he was an avid mushroom hunter. But he realized he couldn't exactly apply his chance-based philosophy to mushroom hunting. I would imagine not. There are some risks involved there that you don't want to leave to pure chance. Exactly. It seems even the most ardent advocate for meaninglessness draws the line at potentially poisonous mushrooms. And this, for Schaefer, it's another example of how even those who claim to embrace the absurdity of it all... They can't fully escape this inherent human longing for something bigger than themselves. It's like we're wired for meaning even if we try to deny it. This is fascinating stuff. We've covered a lot of ground here, but I feel like we're just scratching the surface of Schaefer's thought. We've got a lot more to unpack. So we're back, diving deeper into the mind of Francis Schaefer and his take on, well, the state of modern 
theology, I guess you could say. Last time we were talking about that whole semantic mysticism thing. Right, right. Where you have people using all the right words, but kind of draining the meaning out of them. Like trying to have their spiritual cake and eat it too. Exactly. But Schaefer, he doesn't shy away from the tough stuff. In fact, he tackles one of the most provocative movements head on. Let me guess, the God is dead movement. You got it. But what did they even mean by that? Were they just being edgy or was there more to it? It was definitely more than just a catchy slogan. These theologians weren't just saying belief in God was declining. They were making a much bolder claim, arguing that God never existed in the first place. Whoa, so a full-on rejection of God, not just a crisis of faith. Exactly. They were all about embracing that lower story we talk about, the realm of reason and science, with no need for a higher explanation. So no more trying to dress up a godless universe with pretty spiritual-sounding language. You'd think so, right? Yeah. But here's where it gets really interesting. They might have ditched the word God, but they often held on to this figure of Jesus. Hold on. They got rid of God but kept Jesus. How does that even work? Well, they stripped away the divinity, of course. Jesus became this moral role model, a good guy to learn from, but not God in the flesh. So no miracles, no resurrection, just a very human Jesus. Exactly. Just a really good teacher, someone to inspire us to be better people. But Schaefer argues that trying to build a whole system of meaning just on human goodness, well, it just doesn't hold up. It's like trying to build a house on a foundation of, I don't know, marshmallows or something. It's just not going to last. A very sticky situation, to be sure. And you're right. Schaefer believed that we're wired for something more. So if the God is dead, folks are on one extreme. Who did Schaefer see on the other side? Who are those upper story thinkers he talks about? Yeah, who are those guys? Thinkers like Paul Tillich, for example. They still used religious language, but had redefined it to fit their own philosophies. So back to semantic mysticism, or is there another way to describe what these upper story folks believed? Schaefer suggests many of them, maybe without even realizing it, landed on a kind of pantheism. Pantheism, meaning? Instead of believing in a god who created the universe, they saw god as the universe, this impersonal force that runs through everything. Okay, so instead of god being out there somewhere... He's kind of like the air we breathe all around us. In a nutshell, yeah. And it's a very vague, impersonal kind of God. Not someone you can pray to, but this sort of spiritual energy that makes up reality itself. And this is what Schaefer felt those upper story theologians were really getting at with all their sophisticated theological language. Not the God of the Bible, but this impersonal cosmic force. Pretty much. And Schaefer argued that this ultimately leads to a dead end both intellectually and spiritually. You're left with a sense of awe, maybe, but no real answers to those big questions. It's like having a map without any roads or landmarks. Exactly. A very frustrating road trip. And Schaefer didn't let either side off the hook. He pointed out the contradictions, the inconsistencies, how both attempts to find meaning without a true God just don't quite work. It's almost like they are both trying to solve a puzzle, but with missing pieces. Hmm. And speaking of missing pieces... One of the biggest battlegrounds here, it seems, is history. Especially for those upper story theologians. They really wrestled with how to make their beliefs fit with the historical claims of Christianity, particularly the resurrection of Christ. Right, because that's a pretty big deal in traditional Christianity. Huge. And you can't just brush it aside. So Schaefer noticed that theologians like Karl Barth, who rejected the traditional understanding of Scripture, they still felt this need to anchor their faith in history somehow. It's like they knew that without that historical grounding, their beliefs would just float away. Exactly. But Schaefer argues that their attempts to reinterpret history through this existential lens just weren't convincing. So how did they try to reinterpret things? Well, for example, Schaefer was very critical of this phrase that was popular at the time, God's saving acts in history. God's saving acts in history. What's wrong with that? It sounds nice, but Schaefer pointed out that they weren't really talking about specific moments where God intervened in history. Instead, they meant this vague idea that God is somehow redeeming all of history, even the horrific parts. So less about a God who acts in history and more about a God who's just kind of along for the ride, even when things get messy. Yeah, and Schaefer wasn't buying it. All right, so picking up where we left off, we've been wrestling with Francis Schaefer's critiques of modern theology, this idea that it's kind of lost its way, lost its grounding. But it can't just be all doom and gloom, right? Where does Schaefer see a way forward? You're right. He wasn't just about pointing out problems. Schaefer definitely believed there was hope. 
but he also offered a pretty stark warning. Oh, a warning? Like what? He was really concerned that this whole trend of semantic mysticism, you know, emptying out these big words but keeping those religious sounding shells, it was creating a kind of vacuum. A vacuum? Like in people's minds. Exactly. And vacuums, well, they don't stay empty for long. Something's going to rush in to fill that void. And he wasn't so sure it would be a good thing. So it's not that these upper story thinkers, as he called them, were intentionally trying to mislead people. It was more like their ideas, even with good intentions, could be twisted and manipulated. That's exactly what worried him. Remember how we talked about those advantages of this new theology? The familiar language, the institutional influence. Exactly. It made this new way of thinking really appealing, but also really easy to misuse. Like a counterfeit bill, it might look real at first glance, but... But it's not the real deal, and it can do some serious damage. So what were some of those potential consequences that Schaefer worried about? Well, he was really concerned about this new theology paving the way for a kind of authoritarianism disguised as spirituality. So instead of a clear separation of church and state, you have this murky overlap where these spiritual sounding ideas get used to control people. That's the idea. And because those terms, those big ideas, are so undefined, well, they can be twisted to mean just about anything. That's a scary thought. It's like something out of a dystopian novel, you know, where instead of Big Brother watching your every move, it's this vague sense of spirituality that keeps everyone in line, but nobody can quite define what that even means. And what's even scarier is that it might not even be intentional manipulation. You know, mm. when truth becomes subjective, when everything's up for grabs, well, people in power, even if they have good intentions, they end up shaping reality to fit their own worldview. It's like the self-fulfilling prophecy of meaninglessness. The more we embrace ambiguity and say, well, everyone's truth is valid, the more vulnerable we become to those who claim to offer certainty. And that's what's so dangerous about this kind of thinking. But Schaefer wasn't advocating for blind faith, right. right? Or a return to some kind of rigid dogma. Not at all. He saw the need for intellectual humility, for being open to different perspectives, for constantly wrestling with those big questions. So it's not about shutting down the conversation, but about making sure we're having the right conversation. Exactly. It's about holding on to your convictions while also being open to new ideas and being able to spot those potentially harmful ideas even when they're packaged in really appealing language. That's a tough balance to strike, though. How do we do that? It takes effort. Right. It's about being discerning, about asking tough questions, about demanding clarity, about not just accepting things at face value. And that's especially important when it comes to our faith and our beliefs. Absolutely. It's so easy to just go with the flow, to accept whatever sounds good or feels right in the moment. But Schaefer's challenging us to go deeper than that. We have to, because our beliefs have real-world consequences. They shape how we see ourselves, how we treat each other, the kind of world we build. So as we resurface from this deep dive into Schaefer's thought, what's the one thing you want our listeners to take away from this conversation? I hope they remember that their beliefs matter. Don't just accept them passively. Examine them. Question them. Make sure they're grounded in something solid, something that can stand up to scrutiny. Because if our beliefs aren't rooted in truth, well, then they're just castles in the sand. And as Schaefer showed us, those castles, they might look impressive for a while, but they won't last. Well, I think that's a great note to end on. This has been quite a journey exploring the thought-provoking work of Francis Schaeffer. Yeah. A big thank you to you for guiding us through this deep dive. My pleasure. Always happy to talk Schaeffer. And to our listeners, keep those questions coming, keep seeking truth, and until next time, happy exploring. Happy exploring.